Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Artificial Intelligence Is it the solution to humanity's problems, or will it bring our destruction? We're going to talk about artificial intelligence in its many forms, and what it means for humanity. Will AI be more like Janet from The Good Place, or the T-800? Or maybe it's something more familiar to us, like Siri. Today we go down in the foxhole with John Connor, leader of the Resistance. Wait, I guess it's just my friend Mike. Mike, what are you drinking today? I am still drinking some vodka, and I'd be glad to be part of the Resistance. But this episode, we will be talking about the different types of AI, how AI learns, what AI is being used in our life, what is AI capable of doing, the ethics of AI, and the future that AI may hold in this society. So Nick, how you doing and what are you drinking? I'm doing good. I am a little bit in over my head uh, with artificial intelligence, so I think we you might have to hold my hand in this one, but... It'll be a good one. I got some good things, and, uh, you know, math's never been my strong suit, but I'm drinking bush. Some nectar of the gods, some bush, um, you know, bringing it back to the Midwest. You know, I didn't want to fool anyone. I didn't want anyone to think I was uh, an intellectual, so we're bringing it back down to the, the light and heavy beer domestics. I thought you had a stroke when you were saying bush, to be honest with you. But this episode will be the partly blind leading the blind. I have some familiarity with AI, but not in-depth knowledge upon it, which was quite fun researching this because I had the tools to understand what was happening, but now I was gaining the knowledge of the inner workings. So hopefully I will not lead you too far astray in this. So artificial intelligence, what is it? Well, Webster has it as a definition of a branch of computer science dealing with simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. And I think that might be a bit too dry for actually what AI is. AI is a machine that can learn, both from humans and on its own. AI, artificial intelligence, like could be our replacement, could be our symbiotic friend, could be nothing. We are in a very strange time, my friend. 21st century is going to be a wild one. Now, before we continue, here are some words that will be helpful. So an algorithm, Uh, I'm sure for people who are familiar with computer science and coding and mathematics, that algorithm is a word very used commonly. But for those who maybe were asleep in math class back in high school, An algorithm (laughs) is a set of rules a machine follows to achieve a particular goal. So an example of an algorithm is if you send a car down a tunnel and it crashes into the wall, reset, learn from where that crash is, and and then try again. That would be an example of an algorithm. Another one being machine learning, a computer program that can learn adapt to new data without human intervention the computer can learn based on input and on its own so if i showed you a picture of a duck to the ai and then i gave it a bunch of random image it would have some idea what to look for to identify a duck and we'll be talking about imagery we're talking about audio on different ways of learning and different types but nick i'm curious what do you know about ai well from what i gathered about ai is you know using a lot using computers different algorithms to solve problems and what i the what i learned about ai is holy cow our brains are crazy like how hard it is to simulate that and just the myriad of things that we can do ourselves so part of the problem is as humans we tend to simplify things so just take a simple task like going to the airport and so you leave your house you get in your car and you drive to the airport That should be pretty simple, right? But then you have to think about all the different things that come into play there. The weather, you know, what happens if you get locked out of your house? What happens if your car is a flat tire? You have to deal with all those problems. And a lot of the problem with AI that is figuring out how to get that information to the computer and how to process it. But just our brains do that, you know, regularly. So I, I gained a larger appreciation of how our brains work and how complex it is. But it's also crazy about how close people are getting to solving those 
myriad of problems that, that come up. Because we have AI that do very specific tasks, but we're wanting an artificial intelligence that does a lot of things. And that's that's where things get a little bit more interesting, a little bit harder. You know, we have computers that can play chess and other games really well, but it seems like we're pushing for something that does everything really well. We are getting closer and closer, and it's amazing how much we are imitating nature. Now, in the coder's defenses, human brains have had the luxury of millions of years through evolution to develop. We're trying to make intelligence in a matter of years. So it's the leaps and bounds that coders are making is, is unbelievable. I'm happy you brought up chess. So as I mentioned, there are different types of AI. There are four types of AI. The first type, which is really tied with chess, is called reactive machines. So type one, reactive machines, think a machine that plays chess against a human. The computer knows what the limitations of each piece is. It sees a piece move and reacts to it, hence reactive machines. It's pretty much a machine with no memory, just some rules and purely cause and effect AI, if that makes sense. And that's probably where, if I remember correctly, most AI started was a machine trying to play a game. Yes, we have calculators, but one called calculator AI. That's not really thinking on its own, not predicting. I think AI, AI's first founder, its grandfather, is a chess player, which is, is a nerd like me. I was literally talking about chess theory before recording this episode. is uh, It's exciting to me. Now, type two, limited memory AI. The best example of this would be traffic, like GPS on your phone. It remembers where you slowed down, where you went faster, and stop points. Those stop points being stop signs, traffic lights, uh, congestion and traffic, and it starts to help map out the best path for you. So it's got some memory, so it, it sees, okay, I took this road north at this time, and I had these stops, and I went this speed. Okay, I went to a different store going west, I hit these stops this speed, it was faster than this, so maybe next time I go north, I'll go west first, then north, etc., etc., etc. Type 3, which we're now getting more into the phrase, of AI is the theory of mind. I guess a good example, well, we'll say a crude example of this would be, imagine you visit an alien planet and you have a blank mind, no memory, no knowledge. You don't know how to walk or talk. All you know how to do is to hear and see and remember what you saw. And over time, you watch the aliens, their environment, and you start to deepen your AI knowledge of the aliens, their speech, their movement, their emotions, their customs, their environment, traditions. And over time, the AI will start to adjust, adjust to fit into what they observe. So they're taking different features such as audio, customs, language, because look at the human face, for example. If I say the word Nick, I can say it a thousand different ways. And my facial structure, my how wide my mouth opens, the wrinkles on my face, the eyes, they will all change based on tone. So the theory of the mind is trying to take all these and understand the customs. Imagine, everyone knows a person like this, a person who doesn't understand sarcasm. Now try to imagine teaching a machine sarcasm. It's a bit like theory of the mind, and it's probably the most advanced AI we have currently, and it's working. There, We'll talk about some examples, one specifically by Google, which I have some ties to, which is very exciting. And last but not least, type four, the holy grail, the golden goose, the self-aware AI, a machine with conscious, whatever conscious is, we have yet to know, but an AI that knows it exists and not just am I on, yes, move on to the next function, a AI that can know it has, it knows it has a purpose or can change it. Describing what consciousness is what a lot of philosophers and scientists are trying to do, so I'm not going to be able to solve that over, over, <laughs> A podcast but so nick i figure you have some questions or want to add on to, and yes what any questions so far uh no questions i want to say that for um like the the responsive artificial intelligence that a lot of what that is is just 
the machine's thinking of all the different possible moves like in chess that you can make and it's responding to that and it's not it's not as much that the machine understands the game it understands how to win and it's just plugging in different possibilities to produce the result that leads to the most likely victory it's basically just crunching numbers it's it's using brute force over the human mind it it can exert more think farther ahead run more calculations than the human mind can so it's an early form of artificial intelligence i feel like but i i think that's it's important to note that's kind of what that's doing is just pushing out you know crunching numbers faster than we can yes that's a great way to look at it so those are the types of ai now people have, can make the argument that there's seven types of ai but for the sake of argument i'm gonna stick with four but i want to discuss on how ais learn now nick brought up a good point of brute force of he moved pawn that is and then it starts doing calculations that's one is simply know all the possible outcomes and go from there as the environment changes another one which is a lot is another one which is deeply involved in our lives is hidden markov model or hmms it uses patterns to recognize possibilities so when i say patterns i mean the voice and alexa uses uh hmms your if it your check we're trying to figure figure out what's your handwriting if you take a picture of your check to do online banking your gesture if you want to wave something with uh motion capture sonar uses hmms an hmm is looking for certain attributes and starts to make predictions slash statistics. So an example of an HMMS would be, imagine the video game Sims. For those who don't know what the video game Sims is, it's a 3D video game. Pretty much is the vi it's a virtual board game of the game of life. You decide what they look like, their job, you design their houses, etc. But these characters in this game still have their habits, their character traits, their algorithms. So if I make Nick into an AI in Sims, he will perform such and such duty, no matter what skin color I make him, what height I make him, what where he lives, that will that will just be in his algorithm no matter what. So that'd be his traits. So using HMMs, you can predict what clothes that character or person will wear. If they are indoors, they'll wear X, and if they're outdoors, they'll wear Y. The main difference between X and Y indoors and outdoors is weather. So HMMs, what it does is it keeps tracks of that. So it sees that you're inside, you're not wearing your winter jacket, and then it sees what the weather is. So now over time, those HMMs will observe the weather and your clothing. And over time, it will know what clothes you will most likely choose due to possible climate in the future before you have any idea what you'll do. It'll start making predictions of weather because it's looking for patterns. You'll know, it will know your pants, your shirt, what you will choose on that specific day months before you ever will. And going back to speech and handwriting, every voice is different. You can mimic voices, but there's still pattern recognition. So... I tend to draw out my words like and uh, like that. The pattern you can tell by the peaks and the sound and the tone, all those are attributes to it. And the HMMs copy that, they memorize that. So they can tell if you have an Alexa, who's talking to the Alexa. Is it Nick or is it Mike? And it is able to tell based on those patterns. So another example, they. HMMs, which are, uh, those are a really key point in modern AIs. This is why I keep giving examples because they are important and will be continuing to be important throughout the podcast, is machine learning. So an example of HMM and machine learning, like I said, is learning, learning a person's voice. Again, pitches and tones, but also emphasis. So we can, the AI can tell if we're in a certain mood based on our emphasis. So if we have the habit of playing ACDC when we're happy, it'll start memorizing that. So it'll notice that we're getting ice cream playing ACDC. So it'll start registering that our emotion is happiness and start making predictions of that. So if it knows we're in a bad mood based on the time of our turn of our voice, they're not going to play certain songs. So when a music streaming service such as Spotify, suggests you a song, it's using HMMS. It's gathering information on you and figuring out your location of where you're listening to this music, what time of the day you're listening to this music, what songs you just came from, and using that pattern to make a educated guess or figuring out your lifestyle based on that pattern. 
Yeah, um, my Google Maps does that for me. I'll wake up and it'll say, 10 minutes to get to work, but it's not quite there yet. Now, to be fair, my schedule is ridiculous and there's absolutely no pattern to it, so they'd never be able to figure it out. But sometimes they'll think I'm going in the woods and tell me I'm an hour 45 away. And then sometimes they'll think I'm going to the office and I'm not. But Is your phone even from this decade? My work phone is. Okay, just, just making sure because al- algorithms have greatly improved over the years quite well i I don't like usually saying this word but exponentially it is amazing the leaps and bounds we made in the past few years so old technologies ai versus modern ai it's night and day yeah no this this is a it's only probably two three years old but it is i can see what it's doing and i think it if you had a more regular work schedule it would be a nice tool but i live in out here and there's no traffic anyway so it always takes me 10 minutes to get to work so or you had a more complex ai system maybe now as we mentioned the different types of ai systems like theory of mind theory of mind tends to use not just sound but also sight and also learns it's not just trying to find patterns it's trying to physically learn it's trying to have memory i guess best way to say it it's a toddler with more power than I would ever let a toddler have. Another example of how AI makes predictions and starts seeing patterns is object identification and recognition. It's another method for AI to learn, and it's, so imagine an image of a dog in a field of grass. Now you trace the outline of the dog and tell the computer, the algorithm, that this is a dog. So now every time it sees an image, it will search for this outline. And if it sees an outline, it goes, oh, this outline matches this outline. This is dog. And then it'll add that to its algorithm and continue to grow. If I remember correctly, some photo algorithms are having a hard time identifying cats and was it hedgehog cats and loaf of bread something some animal and something completely opposite of it one of my favorites that i read is uh i forget exactly what fish it was um but let's just for the sake of argument say bonita because uh, it's a trophy fish, Daryl. So yeah, it's kind of big, but it's a fish. You know, that's a sport fish. You know, impressive fish to catch. So it goes through all these pictures of it, but it couldn't identify the fish in the wild because most of the pictures of this fish had people's fingers on the fish. So it only identified the fish with people's fingers in it because it didn't know that the fingers were not part of the fish. You know, a human could say, yeah, the fingers are part of the fish, but if the machine doesn't know what humans are or doesn't know what fingers are, it assumes that that is part of the fish. Most of the pictures of the fish have fingers in it, so hence they must be part of the fish. And this sounds strange to all of you. Imagine if you were only shown the face of a quarter your entire life. You never saw the the tail side of it. And someone finally showed you the backside of a quarter and they go, they go ask you what it is. And you'd go, I don't know what that is. I've never seen that before. It's the same thing. We've never seen that side. And it's, it's amazing how smart and intelligent AI is, but yet still so young and naive. It's, it's it's so weird to think about. It's honestly like teaching a child all over again. It's instead of teaching them how to walk, you're teaching them how to learn. Instead of teach, and then the same way you're teaching them how to read, write. Um, we'll talk about ethics later in the podcast, but it's we're imitating nature. We're making ourselves a machine form almost, and some AI model off our brain, our neurons, are themselves, which is quite weird. How we always end up back to nature of imitating nature, and artificial intelligence is a gap, a bridge between two worlds. Yeah, it's like I said, you know, the machines are definitely advancing. They're doing really incredible things with them. But the more I learn about the problems that AI programmers face, the more I appreciate the human brain. To me, the it seems like I less appreciate the human brain because, yes, the human brain to me is utterly fascinating how complex it is but if we're able to start mimicking it it makes me makes me cautious that how easy it is to mimic we'll talk about uh kanye's uh conway's game of life theory and well not theory conway's game of life later in the podcast but something so simple can cause such complex issues And speaking of complex, that brings me to another point of learning. Now, I apologize if the beginning I'm throwing out a lot of information on you. I want people to understand and comprehend the different forms of AI and what they're capable of doing. Another, so forgive me if I keep 
with the terms and scientific to bring you all up. But another, which I think is the most interesting type of learning, is export systems. So an export system, well, best way to describe it is a quote, monkey see, monkey do. It's an AI mimicking and replicating what a human does, like opening a water bottle. And a system that uses this is also in nursing. So some robotics that in our nursing homes or robotics for the elderly have this system. So they understand when a person is sad, they'll be less up chat upbeat and chippy so it doesn't seem like it's being rude and i it's it's very helpful for the elderly sorry the elderly wow i'm having a hard time saying that word the elder okay i i never thought on this podcast the word you're going to struggle with was elderly that word is uh <laughs> it's supposed to show a significant fact of having a robot ai in their home versus living alone i think it's like a 30% boost in uh, positivity and overall health. Like, it's quite significant. I saw that too, and I thought that that was crazy because if you think anyone is going to be uncomfortable around AI, it would be the older generations. See, the older I get, the less I give a fuck. And I imagine for someone who's in their 80s, their careness level of what I care, what happens around me, must be at a, such a low level that... Eh, robotic, whatever. Of course, it also helps that us humans are very social creatures. Whether we like it or not, Nick, as being antisocial as we are, humans are social creatures. So I guess humans find comfort even when there's no life, just artificial life. Yeah, that's a terrifying thought. But the one most of you, I imagine, clicked on is the AI who can do lots of things. The AI who can create new types of art, new types of music, help people with prosthetic hands can do all these amazing things. This AI tends to learn from a thing called deep learning. Now, deep learning, much like the imagery of the dog trying to figure out the outline, or HMMS of looking for patterns, it does all of it. It's multiple layers of identifying. Like dogs, dogs have a certain outline. Does it now have certain colors, dogs? Does it have certain features of dogs, such as paws or fur it's a checklist of identifying so i i walk into a room the robot in the room has cameras audio it senses my movement sees my movement so it checks am i the in my mic it checks my outline okay it's human okay i say hi to it checks for the recognition of the pattern okay he looks at my clothes says that i said he which is well humanizing but the AI looks at my clothes is he wearing clothes that mike has been previously worn in the past looking predictions of possibly he could have bought these clothes and starts looking at my face does it have certain features as their patterns is my nose the right size my lips the same size the eyes the right color it starts going through this checklist to perfectly identify me and it's the same way for learning other things such as poetry i think it's very interesting that an ai could read a poem of say edward frost and using the same word style and the same flow as that artist, they can mimic it. And they can come up with a completely new poem that's never been made before, but it seems so so familiar to that artist just because it memorized and nearly copied that artist. Just It copied that artist's style and added something new to it, which is terrifying to me. It is, it is exciting but terrifying. So Nick, how, did, how does that make you feel? So I'm not a huge... Uh... Like, I support art, and I think some art is really cool. I'm not a huge fan of artists in general, um, but I do think that certain art is art because of the emotions that go into it, and I don't, to me personally, and I'm not super into the artsy world, so don't crucify me, but I don't think it's art if a machine creates it. I think it's looking at algorithms of, of what people like, looking at the data saying people like this. This is a painting style people are familiar with. They like this. These are topics they like. These are artists, paintings that have sold well in the past, We've gotten positive response from this, and it's just putting out what people want. Now, I'm sure it's going to be really awesome and really cool and better than anything most people are creating, sure. But to me, it just seems like I wouldn't be surprised if there's something missing. I wouldn't be surprised if these machines came up and, I mean, I could see it going both ways. I could see it being a colossal failure or just the coolest thing I've ever seen. 
I don't know. I feel like the art is one of those things that you need that human emotional touch to do. Well, what is emotion? Emotion, for the most part, is just a bunch of chemicals in our brain and the history affiliated with those chemicals. So when we're in pain, we'll produce certain chemicals. Now we associate that pain with this chemical. And that chemical, if that chemical comes up again, we associate it with pain. It's nature versus nurture, but AI seems to have both. It's, I disagree with you, Nick, because I don't know what conscious is. We could have already made an AI with conscious. We could always make an AI that makes, we already make an AI that makes decisions on its own. We do the same thing for humans. Humans can make decisions on their own. Well, how they learn is monkey see, monkey do. AIs can do monkey see, monkey do. AIs need to be taught, hey, how to read, how to write. They start recognizing voices. Humans do all the same thing. It's, I think we need to broaden our spectrum on what it means to be intelligent because you can make the argument well can't have consciousness because humans made it well humans make kids what i would say that's a form of creation if you keep going back enough before we were humans it's the same thing it's just nature putting us in an environment where we had to adapt and learn much like a lot of this ai yeah i mean i think it all depends on the intelligence of the ai what it was programmed with did you ever play mass effect i have not okay well it's just a sci-fi game but there's a a faction if you will the geth and they are artificial intelligence more of a hive mind but they're all synthetic robots and they have kind of a, a collective mind but they're you know classic ai story from pretty much anything i just happened to pick this one and they become um you know, they, they have a mind of their own, they realize they're being used, and all they want to do is be left alone. And so, to me, through the story, you, you find out they, they don't really have feelings of, like, the same way we have feelings, but they, they have fear in the sense they know if they go by these certain people that they're going to be attacked. And they have, you know, it's more of a, just a response to stimuli, which they reminded me more of uh, leeches in that it's not really as much of a brain as a bunch of neur neurons that respond to touch and changes in the environment but still some kind of intelligence there and i feel like that that is more what i'm picturing as a uh, definitely intelligent i mean they can build and improve upon their own design they understand they're man-made but at the end of it it's more of a response to stimuli than it is a, a thought i don't know i just i feel like it'd be so hard to correctly program thoughts and feelings the way that we experience them that to me i find it hard to believe that we could create something that has thoughts and feelings not just a response to stimuli that's expected so i disagree with you because what you described is pretty much a human of thought ai can think creation ai can think ai reacts to its environment like humans do and i before i continue i want to ask you the question why does an ai have to be like us in order for it to have emotions why is our perspective this perspective used to determine whether an ai is intelligent conscious or has emotions well i think there's a I mean, that's a good point i understand just because we might not all think alike doesn't mean we don't have the same thoughts and i think um, an important thing to bring up right now would be the Turing test. I think I told you about this. I don't know if you researched it. I did of the humans looking humans looking for faces similar to ours, and it freaks us out when it's too similar to ours. No, that's the um, uncanny valley. the the tur uh, The turning test is a Turing test. I think it is. So to determine if an AI has quote unquote consciousness, an AI and a man will each be on a computer, and there'll be a impartial third party on the receiving end and the the third party will send out uh questions to the ai and the computer or to the ai and the man and they will answer them and after a certain amount of questions if the person asking the questions can't determine which one is the artificial intelligence and which is the human then it's supposed to have determined consciousness well that's already happened if that's what you are using to your definition of consciousness like the gpt-3 even though it's still in beta testing has fooled many people online using something very similar to that with like tweets it fooled redditors for weeks 
Like with that test in mind, what you just said, AI that we currently exist and AI I applied for, I applied to have the GPT-3 because it's the best AI. So hopefully they'll allow me to test it for drift and accelerometers and GPS and G uh, gyroscopes. But that test, has already been proven that AI can do it. So I would say your hypothesis. But is was it an actual like Turing test where like the man knew one of them was AI and had to guess, or was it just fooling people on the internet? Because Russia can do that and they've done that time and time again. But when you know that one of them is human and you can't, or one of them isn't human and you can't figure it out, I feel like that's a, a little bit different of a test. I believe so. I believe they i believe the creator knew the AI, with who the ai was and released the ai and people on the internet could not identify it yeah i don't know i don't know the study or, or the what you're referencing i didn't come across that so i can't speak but i think it's pretty crazy to not be able to tell you know what between a person and whatnot and i think we've all come across this in, in social media where you you see some someone's comments you're like how can anyone be that stupid and it's like oh they have one follower blah blah, blah. it's like oh it's because they're you know a russian bot or whatever but this is completely different this is you know, having full-blown conversations from what it sounds like, not just one dumb message or response or whatever. Four different AIs have completed the turning test. I just did a quick Google. Yeah, so there you go. I You brought up social media, and perhaps it might be a good point to talk about social media. That is probably the AI most people use. So like I said, AI isn't tons of things. Like if you think AI... Is futuristic technology. We've been using AI for years. It's in social media, self-driving cars, texting, internet searching, video games, ads, banking, stock market, security, healthcare. The list goes on and on. AIs have been around forever. If you ever took a picture of your check to cash in a check, that's an AI. If you ever been showed a video that you might like in your YouTube recommended feed, that's AI. If you've ever, well, a big part to me, which is a story I found very funny, I believe it was in 2010 or 2012 is when the stock market crashed because of an AI fault. Nick, do you know this story? Uh, nope. So many stock markets, well, I should rephrase this. Many companies create AIs to play the stock market. And it's a very competitive field because lots of money is on the line. It's the stock market. So if your AI is capable of learning patterns and moving money around, it will do so and make you lots of money because AI can make decisions in nanoseconds compared to minutes of a human. So that's how a large portion of the stock market is exchanged is through artificial intelligence, through computers, if them doing their own selves. Well, unfortunately, I believe it was a Canadian company or it could have been American company, one, one of the two, created an AI with a system error. And usually when it's high amounts of like sell, 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 they still needed approval of a human, but for some reason, either this surpassed it or they, they didn't have any security features. And within nanoseconds, a artificial intelligence caused all the other artificial intelligence to panic and crash the stock market. I think they froze it for three days while they sorted it out, put everything back to normal. But pretty much within 0.1 nanoseconds, an AI made a decision to sell a stock and it just caused, for no reason, just a bad idea or something like that. And like, it's not was supposed to do that, didn't have the authorization. And it just caused all the rest of the artificial intelligence to panic and sell and crash the stock market for a couple of days, which is, so our artificial intelligence is deeply ingrained in our society. Now, going back to social media. So I don't use social media. If you ever listened to our podcast before, I'm not the biggest fan of it. That's why we have Nick. Nick's our social media guy. But we are, it's so amazing that as a society, as a world, we are giving up our privacy to make AI being at being better at selling both ourselves and selling us things. Most AI are not focused on what is doing best for us, simply what works best on us. To keep our attention, to get more views, to figure out what we buy and use target placement. AI is ingrained to us. Every time you get a notification, every time you scroll through videos, every time you get suggested something new, every time you see see a like or dislike that's all built in for ai and that's all ai doing the work we we are quite ingrained with ai our entire lives yeah and it's uh it's gonna get better right like we're gonna get less ingrained with ai as time goes on because that's the path history shown right actually there is some hope not much hope but even the bottom of pandora's box there was a glimmer of hope but currently there are no didn't they didn't they shut the box before hope could get out no they well i think in the real myth it was a clay pot and they ocean it it was all of all the demons all the monsters everything plagued all the terrible thing terrible in the world and the very bottom was hope so there was still hope they escaped and that's why 
sometimes things are good. Gotcha. But anyhow, AI can do a lot of dangerous things, but there is, again, hope. Currently, there are no regulations, well, no real regulations on AI and what it can and cannot do. But people are starting to figure out, hey, maybe maybe we should pump the brakes a little bit, come up with rules. There's a reason why for genetic engineering, there are rules. There's a reason why uh, some countries can't have nuclear bombs and some others can't. There needs to be ethics. There needs to be stability. And we're not quite there yet, but at least there are talks about eventually having it. But Nick, if I was going to be a betting man, I... I wouldn't bet on Skynet happening or the Terminator or or I-, I am robot, but AI could do more damage than good if we're not careful. Mike, if you're going to tell me that humanity is going to invent an object that can do tremendous good and tremendous damage, I would be blown away. <laughs> We've done so much good with it, though. AI. Or is this just like, well, I was saying, is this just like any other tool we create? It has the potential to do really great things, but if it's in the wrong hands, it has the potential to do bad things. It's risks we have to weigh. But to me, AI is definitely you know the future, and I think it's going to do a, a lot of good for the society that hopefully outweighs the bad from some terrible party that's going to do something stupid. Doubtful, but possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think a good point to bring out is your choices do matter a lot, especially with algorithms and the AI that you're using. So I can't remember which electric company it was, but they're making electrical vehicles and they put out a morality slash ethic test of there are three people to the left, one person on the right. Who do you steer the car into? Because they're trying to program possibilities and ethics into AI. And that's that's crazy to think about. I I that hurts my head. I don't know how to comprehend that. Oh, I know. That was wild. Because they're basically trying to get the the value of human life. They're trying to put a number on it, saying women are worth X, men are worth Y, kids are worth W, like and then the AI is supposed to look around, figure out the outcome that minimizes human casualties according to the values assigned to them you know an older woman might be worth less than a younger woman it just it's a it's a dark you know it's pretty dark but you know that's something they need to figure out so you got to go down that hole yes machines like that they tend to use they tend to use transfer learning and supervised slash unsuper and unsupervised learning so transfer learning is gaining knowledge saving it and using it at a a later point so if it and we'll stick on cars for a moment. If it learns what a truck is, even though it's only known cars, it will save it. So next time it sees a truck, it can identify it as a truck, and then it can tell if the truck is moving or not because it already has some background knowledge on truck, so it can start adding other attributes on it. So you can teach an object of, hey, this is a truck, show a picture of it, but to now understand that the truck is moving is a different feature, but transfer learning is able to do that. Now, supervised learning is where morality comes in, such as us, where we enter in those inputs of, hey, do you kill this baby or not? Well, of course not. It's a baby. Well, now what happens if I tell you this baby is Hitler? That changes everything. So we have to teach it something, but watch while it's learning so it's not learning the wrong thing. So if it does an image search, so if you type in a uh, pen on your computer, it'll show you images of pens. Well, in the beginning, before it had unsupervised learning, where it just kept associating those words and images and having a larger database to go back on, they manually had to tell you what a pen was. So that was supervised learning. So every time it would not choose a pen, but thought it was a pen, you have to go, no, 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 don't do that. Don't put that in your mouth. That's bad. Just like a kid. And it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. And like Mike said, a lot of times with that kind of learning, the part of the problem is it can learn to recognize a pen and maybe a pen's a bad example but it doesn't understand what a pen is it just assigns it the numerical values to say the car is supposed to avoid pens or say strollers instead it's more realistic it doesn't really know what a stroller is it just has an assigned value of you know 12 on the life scale i don't i don't even know what that would be but and so it's going to try and avoid a stroller but maybe not at the cost of a pregnant woman who has like a 46 value you know it's so it's responding to like it it understands it can recognize that the certain value can recognize what it's looking at as a stroller or a pen but at the same time it just it doesn't really understand completely what it is it's just going off of values this this kind of ai or i'm reading this wrong mike it depends on which a you're talking about you gotta imagine i i as weird as I, as weird as it says, AI is like um, different speed. Each per is individual basis. It's each AI is its own entity. So you have a car AI, which is identifying moving traffic, pedestrians, street lights, stop signs, traffic. But then you have AI, which is like the GPT 
dash three from Google, identifying what a pen is, figuring out, searching around the internet, fi figuring out what it's used for, and then tries using itself in like 3D paint or something like that, where they can create their own poems, their own posts, their own ideas, I, for lack of better words, their own their own content uh, idea. Right, but that's not really like the the AI you're seeing in like uh, what's not remote control cars, self driving cars, self driving cars. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, they're more. When I read, it seems like they're more you know recognizing dangers and hazards and and driving accordingly, and for the most part, only on highways. For that AI you're more than correct cool but i i'm just saying yeah no for sure like definitely there's there are ai who do understand that but for where we are at with technology in 2020 we don't have those in vehicles yet unless i'm wrong do we no we don't have those in vehicles but there's no necessary necessity to have those in vehicles no good point you yeah. see what i mean like if you're if you're a coal worker you don't need to know how to be in a neurosurgeon if you're a neurosurgeon you don't know how to you don't need to know how to drive an airplane like it's very career based on what the ai is doing so i think that's very important that ai is like a bouquet of flowers each flower is different it has a different task and their features even though they are all technically ai yep but a big thing i kind of want to connect generations so sometimes we have our age sometimes we have older generations so the ai I don't want to... Hey, Mike, I don't think anyone knows how old we are. No, we've said it before in other podcasts. Oh. But... Okay, mid-20s. Speak for yourself, an old man at heart. <laughs> okay. But for the older crowd, I want you to think of the Nelson Company. If, for those who don't know what it is, Nelson Company, back in the day of cable, if cable is still a thing, they would come back, come to your house, plug in a box, and it would record what you're watching so it could figure out a sample size of what Americans are watching and change the networks accordingly or produce what shows accordingly well the ai is the same thing but on your instagram on your facebook which you can check us out on backyard philosophy on instagram or facebook highly recommend it but that algorithm of hey this is what you're watching this is what gets you the this makes this, this is what keeps you on the screen the longest we'll play another video like that to keep you on the longest we'll suggest something that is aggravating for you because it's shown in recent studies that something that makes you mad you're more likely to watch because you disagree with it and it'll keep that algorithm going it's a modern nelson company in your phone and it's constantly going and it's an ai constantly targeting just you and it's, again it found me how many people are giving up that information willingly as a person who likes using vpns who likes privacy and security and like not being traced and constantly all my information being recorded it's i sound like a psychopath but i don't like that i don't like when ais can do that without my permission yeah but it's happening all around us a lot of people don't care but i think more not that people don't care i think most people just don't know that they're being there that their actions are being recorded and used in to identify these things and solve these different problems and used in this way i think it's i disagree i think i think a large portion of the population knows they're being recorded not to sound like Oswald 1984, but people know and just don't care. I think I think too many people are willing to feed into algorithms before that feel. It's a drug. Social media is a drug, and AI is the best drug dealer out there. It's uh, there's a quote I can't remember from where it's from, but cont social media and drug dealers are the only ones to call their their content not the content, their buyers, users, drug dealers and social media. I, I butchered that quote and I apologize, but both social media and drug dealers call their target audience users, which is very telling in my opinion. And since we've been talking about ethics, I want to kind of stay on ethics. A big problem I saw with AI is the hard time telling between fiction and fantasy. And I'm sorry, fiction and fantasy to reality. It's, it doesn't know better. So for a human learning the difference between fantasy and reality it knows when it's watching a television show because it doesn't live in that television show it's in a different world when it's ai both the fantasy and reality are the same world so that's when more moral dilemmas come up of hey i just watched this person on youtube kill ten thousand people in a video game i guess that's a normal thing and then starts calculating that into its ethics and before i get too far nick i i want to hear your opinion on i i've been talking quite a bit this episode and i i feel bad for hogging the mic so i want to give you some time to speak on your points now we've all spent a lot of time deep diving into facebook's uh user agreement that 3,000 page document that we all just clicked accept. South Park had an excellent episode on it. But the ethics I want to talk about 
about, Mike, is should AI identify itself as AI? So when you log into Facebook and they start collecting your data, should Facebook have to say, this is like an artificial intelligence is using your data to sell you whatever? Or another example would be you call the doctor's office and it sounds like you're talking to a woman on the other end and she is responding to your questions and doing all this, but it's not a real person, but it sounds like it. And if you didn't know that it was an AI, it, I mean, you wouldn't know. So if she didn't identify herself as such, you wouldn't know. So should those artificial intelligences have to identify themselves as AI? What do you think? No, with certain exceptions. No, if it's something like customer support some, or asking a question or something like that. But if it's life or death, I believe so. So like we said, monkey see, monkey do. There are certain types of AI that mimic humans. And a great one is surgery. Some robots are learning how to do surgery, such as humans do it, but better because they're machines. Now, if it's a life or death situation or something very important, like refinance, like uh, your mortgage on your house is late or something like that, yes, I think you should identify that you are not a human and you should be able to allow to ask for a human. But if it's something simo- simple, like, I don't know, calling to see if something is in stock at a store, no. I don't think it's necessary. I think that's just simple to do because you could technically do that online on the computer with a few clicks to figure out if that inventory is in stock. So I imagine something as simple as, hey, can I make an appointment for so-and-so doctor? That should be AI and shouldn't the AI shouldn't have to identify itself. What about you? What's your opinion on it? I think, uh, I think they should have to identify themselves just for the purpose of if I'm talking to a computer, I'm going to talk different than if I'm talking to a person. You know, if I know I'm talking to a computer, I'm not going to be like, oh, like, how was your day? Blah, blah, blah. Like, I'll just be getting getting what I need and, and getting out of there. And so it'll make the everything simpler, I think, if they just say you're talking to like our receptionist program or whatever you want to call it. And then it's honest. You, you put it all up in the air get it over with and then you go about your business and it's really not that big of a deal i mean i don't know what you gain by hiding that it's not a real person um i guess maybe like it's not as exclusive i guess the program might be cheaper than having a receptionist there if you're going for that kind of atmosphere in your business but i mean i don't know it's yeah i have a personal question for you nick why do you not want to ask an ai how it stays going but you want to ask a human how their ai how their day's going if you could still have a full conversation with an ai why not do it so that ai that you had a conversation with on the phone of hey i'd like to make this appointment oh i'm doing pretty good how about you well that ai could be implemented into an ai for the elderly of more common phrases more human interactions that ai could be useful in other places through different types of learning <laughs> like like transfer learning that'd be a great example of it but why why be a machinist i'm trying to say that as like a racist or bigotry thing why be a machinist of you don't want it a luddite is that what it's called a luddite doesn't like technology i don't know yeah well i mean why be a luddite when you can have a full conversation and have a meaningful conversation with uh, someone someone who well i would i would say most ai most high functioning ai might have more intelligence than a human they have well some ai have the entire internet to ask and figure out and figure out patterns and recognitions of history events the things you might not know about so why nick why wouldn't you want to have a conversation with an ai efficiency what i have going on in my day i'd rather if i know it's something i like i'd love to just you know schedule a doctor's appointment i had to call the doctor or leave a message saying i need to schedule a physical for the fire department i'd love to call the call them and say these are the times i can do what can you guys do work around instead of having to wait for them to call me back yeah it'd be it'd be nice but i have a lot going on every day if i have one less you know conversation to do and maybe it is interesting but i don't know to me maybe i am a luddite and i just don't get technology but i think if i'm calling like a doctor's office to schedule a message then i just want to get what i came to do done and once i'm done i'm out of there but maybe a better thing would be an ai that doesn't work at a doctor's office it's just like um i never had it but i forget what it was i wouldn't all the uh aim and you could message those bots or whatever something like aim yeah aim sorry i never had it <laughs> um <laughs> I never had it either. But anyway, um, you message those bots, something like that, where maybe like if I wanted, I read, I just finished this book 
and Mike still hasn't read the book, but I want to talk to someone about that book who's read the book. That, I think, would be great use for AI. But if I'm just trying to get information or get something done, then I'm not going to waste time talking to a computer when I don't have to. Well, I think talking to the computer would be more efficient. And I find it ironic that you use the word efficient when trying to make a doctor's appointment. I meant not using AI to make a doctor's appointment. I feel that's a bit, it's just ironic that you chose that word. But do you not do the same for talking to a human to make a doctor's appointment go hey these are the times these this is who i'm supposed to see this is my name these are the doc uh, this is the times i can do what can you do for me yeah but i also ask how the person's doing and you know why we we because we're probably one or two people separated in this town so i probably know her or, her, or know her friends so i'm gonna be more polite and i'm gonna be nicer and because i'm about to go see her actually anyway but more because you know she's a member of my community and ai is not well i think that depends on your community i imagine for a city it would be different and i also imagine what you define as a community it would be different so is your community just your town is your community just your county is your community just your state is your community just your country is your community just your continent is your community all of humanity i think that's very dependent on different people and i also imagine a machine that you're nicer to <laughs> this is weird as it sounds can be nicer to you there are machines if you treat it mean it'll give snarky comments back like those chatbots on aim not aim jesus even even my old man knows that one well you know what maybe you should run this social media because apparently i don't know shit <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to t tell me how to turn it on <laughs> oh god no you're good um yeah i don't know like don't get me wrong i'm not gonna be one of those people who calls like the whatever ai and just starts talking shit to it i don't know but like you know i'm from the midwest i can't be that rude <laughs> it's just it's the reason why i'm not trying to grill you or anything like that it's just the more i study and learn ai and the more ai advanced the more similarities i see it to human beings granted we are kind of making it in our own image but it's it's like a venn diagram with more similarities than there are differences so look at humans as much as you like to think humans are as much as you like would disagree humans are predictable actually making a free will choice is rare most humans have a pattern like nick you might say your sporadic pattern but if you look at it over a long term a long pattern and then similar people in the past of your simulations you'd see a pattern you'd see you'd see a rut so actually making a free will choice is hard so Again, look at, look at, all right, so take this example, New Year's Eve, millions upon millions of people around the world make a New Year's resolution to do something that year. What, less than 25%, may, probably even less than that, make an actual change. People like habits, people like familiarity, people go back to the same traits they've always done. And AI is very similar. AI will do traits, will learn and go back to old habits and very rarely make a significant change or do something random. Humans have nature and nurture. AI have base code and machine learning. Nature being our DNA of our ancestors, the things we can't help, like being afraid of the dark because there were predators in the past. Much like that could be an AI's base code of, hey, fear the dark because there are something threat you can write that in a code then you have nurture of a parent teaching their kid of the classmates figuring out how to interact with other people that's machine learning it's just biotech that's sorry not biotech biology versus technology they're the same thing just different ways to get to that point and it's it's nervous to me be, when we have to start making ethical decisions because like we said there are biases in ai and to think about this if you're an alcoholic father you might not be the best parent and it would negatively affect how your child turns out based on its learning much with ai bias if a person or people who are writing the code over time those flaws can be emphasized on how it learns people who write the code could be having a so i, I have a, a real world example of what you're talking about so i forget exactly what company and what business but they had an AI that was going to do all their hiring. And in the past, their hiring from women's colleges never worked out. So the machine saw that. And so it stopped hiring people from women's colleges is what they thought it was doing. But what it actually saw was a connection between women and being fired because women's college was in the resumes. So it just started sorting out women from the hiring process. Now that was a bias it picked up from the people it was learning from, but it was still a bias. I mean, it's not perfect. Much like humans, AI is not perfect. Perfect. And it's funny how similar errors can happen to both machine and man. That's right. You can, 
gosh. This is so weird saying, especially in the PC world currently. AI can, I guess, technically be racist, sexist, or it could be a bigot. It's weird to think about, but the coder who writes that code could target a specific group or a flaw that could be a simple flaw of, hey, he accidentally wrote three plus three equals seven instead of six. Well, over time, every time six come like three plus three comes up in like a pattern voice recognition or something like that it'll equal seven it'll be error it'll be wrong and the more that happens the larger the imp emphasis it happens in the ai and how the ai will learn and how where the ai gets their information speaking of where ai gets their information we talked about those tests of hit three people or one people it scares me that some ai learns from the internet just due to the amount of trolls dumb people on the internet it like it's it's weird to get the information take video games for example if you was an ai there are AI in video games to help you play the game or change how you play the game, but if an AI was going to transfer information from a video game into the real world, that'd be terrible. That'd be dangerous. Because what you do in a video game world, your ethics, your choices in a fantasy world might be very different what you make in the real world. So if I'm playing Red Dead Redemption, I might be bored and go find some outlaws and just kill them. Well, the AI just saw me kill people who are criminals. So it might target people who were criminals and kill them. It's real world possibility. It's not even science fiction. It's, it's, it's reality now because there are AI who are predicting the chances of repeat offenders out of prison, which I disagree with. I believe if you serve your time, it should be done with, but that's a whole different conversation. So when AI is keeping tabs on people or AI is making assumptions on people, I feel, I feel it's the same way with humans. You shouldn't make, you should make assumptions are good to a certain point, but sometimes you need to be open-minded to the change of possibility and uh, I'm sorry, the possibility of change. And AI is unfortunately have that. I mean, imagine if an AI got its information from 4chan, like that would be horrible. Or if an AI got its information from Twitter, that'd be horrible. It's just all the hate, all the misinformation. Imagine if you're, if you had a fourth grade teacher growing up who was high on LSD and drinking whiskey in front of you while trying to teach you how to do multiplication. It'd be, that'd be the easiest equivalent I can think of doing. It's where where the AI gets their information is so important and how the AI gets their information is so important. I, and I think we should take a little stroll to our neighbors to the West, China, and how they're using AI in their society. I don't know, did you run across this, Mike? I did not. I, I went down a different path. Okay, so China, uh, known above anything else for their love of freedom, they're using AI to, depends what viewpoint you look, but to rate members of their society. In bigger cities, they have cameras everywhere, and the AIs learn to identify people. And they're in the launches of this, they're, it's not across the entire country but they're trying to roll it out so these cameras recognize people and then it watches the, everything they do and assigns them value points to their actions so you throw your trash out in the trash can you get points you th you throw your you litter you lose points and so every action you do gets judged by this ai and you get a rating compared to everyone else in your neighborhood people who have higher ratings can do things if you drop below a certain point you can't ride public transportation or you can't fly on planes, depending on what your rating is. It's all decided by the AI and the Chinese officials. And at the room... Wasn't this... Sorry, to interrupt you. Yep. What, wasn't this a Black Mirror episode? Was it? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen... It feels like... It feels like getting likes on a cell phone was like super important. It's sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It just seems like... It just seems like 1984 and Black Mirror combined to be a reality. Yeah. But it's uh, it's a very real thing, which I was like, oh, that could never happen here. But sure enough, I mean, people want to bring it here because they're using the one thing that I can agree with them on is like, man, I wish people who litter were punished more. But the point is, I don't really want a computer judging my actions. And, and as much as I hate litterers, I don't think that's the way to go. People who litter? What would you call that? Who do you? What's... What was the term? For Garbage humans. Yeah, trash humans. That's yeah, that's probably it. Out, out of curiosity, Nick, because it seems, as I say pretty much every episode, we do our own research independently. I would say, what's your opinion, Nick, on AI overall? I have a more positive but cautious approach to AI. I think it's a. I think it'll be a thing that benefits everyone in the future. And it seems, I might be misjudging because just 
recently what you said about China that you seem to be worried more about AI negatively. Yeah, well, here's, here's what I think the issue is. Much like everything we talk about, people who don't understand it want it to be super regulated and because they, they don't understand it. And that's me. I don't understand AI. That being said, I don't want it to be super regulated. I want the industry itself to regulate it. I want them to weed out their bad players and, and whatnot. And I think AI is something that you know, certain countries have talked about banning it, which I don't think is the issue or definitely not the solution. Because just because you ban it in one country doesn't mean the entire world's going to stop looking into AI. It's ridiculous. But I think uh, I think there's a, definitely, I, just like anything humanity invents, I think the good can outweigh the bad. And it's just a matter of keeping the bad out of the bad people's hands. I don't know. That's kind of where I'm at. So... I disagree a little bit with just let the competition sort it out. I kind of want to take the approach of how we did with the early stages of the internet, of have a base. Regu- I, I wouldn't say not let the competition sort it out, but I don't want people like me or people in political power right now, the ones who regulate it. I'd, it'd be nice if the industry itself came out and said, these are the rules we want to play by. These are the issues we see. I, I want them to come up with some common sense, like their common sense views. I don't look, there are people in Congress right now who think that the island of Guam is going to tip over and who don't understand how Facebook makes money. Are these the people you want regulating AI? Well, I'm not saying the Congress people. I'd want to still come up with a committee. Yeah, but I, I'm just saying I want like the, the industry itself to say, these are all around the board. These are the issues that we're dealing with. This is where we think the line should be. Have them give some input. I want to hear from them. I don't want us the U.S. to just snuff out another industry because of fear. I sort of agree with you. I half agree with you. As I was trying to say, in the early stages of the internet, there was a community and regulation of the internet that was really good by our government of not limiting people's choices based on internet, based on their region, based on their resources. It kind of let the doors open for internet. And I would kind of like the same thing of having a very base rule of hey you can't design this is just a crude example not a real thing i'm just saying it is you can't design ai to attack our nuclear silos just just base rules just like something simple regulations but then i agree with kind of let humans choose the morality because our over the years morality changes with humans i mean hell look at 30 years ago what is appropriate back then versus appropriate back now light years it's time changes all but I I think this is a very ish, important issue where we should have regulation that's not just done by the people in the industry. Because the people down, if you're, I imagine it's a bit like Albert Einstein working on the nuclear bomb. Of If you're doing it for the science, the art, it was something beautiful in the beginning, and it turned out something so ugly at the end. It's without an outside opinion to see, you might be playing something too close to the chest, and people in the industry might, might not see it. It's it's just my opinion. It's neither right nor wrong. It's just just something that I think about. For sure. I think before we get too far into politics or turn around, unless you want to respond to the point I'm going to make, is that the cat's out of the bag. Like, AI is not going away. So we need to be at the top of the game defensively, the United States government, and hopefully our private industries as well, so we don't get lost in the wake of whoever comes next. Because a lot of countries who may or may not be our rivals or allies are working on the same thing and it's not going to be too long before this technology is going to be used for war just like all technology so i'm just just worried about a knee-jerk reaction to people trying to to ban it or do whatever because they don't like it because that's this is what we do in 2020 oh we definitely shouldn't ban it to me ai ai is like a catalyst to me of creation ai allows us to come up with new medicines test new drugs design new types of batteries that are more efficient when we're researching and our links and sources are in the description area and youtube page of stanford's using ai to develop better batteries again ar AI can create art music code it can create its own code it can create movies. It can write essays. There are AI musicians that can freestyle based on what other people are playing in the room, much like a human. AI is... Here, here's what I, for me personally, what I think AI would be good for in our, my industry, because Mike, we're bringing it back to growing trees. How? It's, it doesn't make, how? How did you make that connection? All right. So we use herbicides to, right before we plant, uh, well a few months before we plant. We'll spray herbicides in our site prep spray to kill competing vegetation to allow the trees a better chance to grow. And AI 
what I think its job in our industry would be would be compiling all the data from the years we've been doing different site preps, comparing notes on pre-vegetation, pre-treatment vegetation, post-treatment vegetation, and follow-up treatments to select based on vegetation on the ground, soil type, not only what herbicides to apply, but the rate, just enough to get what you want killed, but nothing more to save us money and to reduce any runoff that may occur for whatever reason. Um, so we're putting the bare minimum on, but we're getting the most bang for our buck and we're targeting everything there. What, to me, from what I understand of AI, is it's a good number cruncher. There are things that we know as humans that may maybe we can't really put into to numbers, but these AIs can just take vast quantities of numbers and churn them out to something like that. They can, some kind of program that'll help us. To me, that's where I see it benefiting my industry the most, besides also being looking at our tree farm and saying, okay, this is how many acres you have, taking all the different stands at various ages, board feet for those stands, how many, basically how many trees we have, dividing it up into, we cut, we can cut this much a year, we can cut this much a year, it grows back at a rate of X, and so this is how much we can cut every year, this is where we should cut it from, and we already have, I mean, we already have AI doing that for us, telling us that, but as it gets better, it'll be doing more and more, and it'll get better and better, and make more sense logistically. Now, like I said, we use AI to determine where we want to make a cut, but sometimes it doesn't factor everything in. For example, logging costs. It'll have us just based on, I mean, it factors in logging costs, but so if we have a unit that's way north in our area and it's ready to harvest just based on whatever metrics it's using, um, but then they'll say the next unit is way down south, even though maybe there's a unit a mile away that we wouldn't have to low boy equipment to that makes more sense to harvest. And that's what the humans are there for now to kind of double check that. But, you know, like Mike said, AI is here and I, I, I do think it's going to be great. And I think it's going to be really beneficial for agriculture and all this stuff of reducing all those problems that we have now and making everything more efficient. But I mean, I am excited for the future. Don't get me wrong, Mike. I love how AI might be our replacements or the way how humans live forever. And yet you bring it back to trees. It hurts my brain. Hey. I think people need real world examples of what it's being used for, what it can be used for in all different ways. I mean, it's tough because AI can be used for literally anything. AI is, again, more similar to a person. You can teach it how to do what job you need, much like teach a person how to do a certain job. But AI, as I was saying, was is so <laughs> creative. I To me, it's creativity. If it can create something that's never been created before and inspire people... I mean, how is that? How is that not art? Or if it can, if it can, AI can run tons of simulations of different molecules, different chemicals together to come up with different drugs. Why not use it? But since I brought it up of immortality and our replacements, I'll say this right off now, folks. AI is not going to be our replacements. If I if I had a bet, I'd say it would become intertwined with it, not our replacements. I think we would join together, not be overpowered by it. I mean, we already are attached to it. Look at your phone. Your phone is filled with AIs, and it we what is what is there's a word for that? What uh, uniformity? When we join, no, when we join with AI, it starts with an S. We join with machines. I just know of cyborgs. I, I'm having a hard No, like there's a point in time when humans and machines joined and oh my gosh. I'm not not to bring it back to, to Mass Effect, but it's like it's not symbiosis. Anyway, I'll look it up. Keep talking. Okay. Well, that's my bet money. If I was gonna bet humans will join together with technology. I mean, look at the neural network. That's helping people with nervous system problems. But if you had full access to the internet, you wouldn't have to learn. You literally just have to update your code of, hey, how do I do trigonometry? All right, download this file. All right, I'm good to go. Biotech, I think, is the way of the future, and I think AI is a good way to do with that. Big point for this is the bottleneck effect of binary. So all computers, all phones and software, they use binary ones and zeros it's two bit information so what is it is it six zeros is oh is it six characters or eight characters i think it's eight characters if it's eight characters that's a that's a byte if you have multiple there are bits if you have multiple of that there are multiple uh megabits megabytes gigabytes terabytes etc so ones and zeros there's only so many possibilities so a lot of companies are working on different ways of computing one being dna dna would be four bit coding 
well, not well, it'd be four code because it has A, T, C, and G. So it'd do a lot more complex things. And I mean, look at how much memory is stored in one strand of DNA. Imagine that for a computer. It'd be huge. And AIs could be intertwined with us. But we could also use AI to bring back our dead dead ones, our, our loved ones. Our, we could do it to for ourselves to bring ourselves into immortality. We could download our patterns, our voice, our image, the texture of our skin, our chemicals in our body. We could copy all that information. We could mimic where people have a hard time identifying if that's an AI or not, and it would look just like you, talk like you, a doobie-doo, just be like you. And it's possible it's it's already happening people are making virtual people I, it's scary to me because i saw uh this one video of a ai creator making a using his daughter as a template and that's just it's weird to me about playing god with ai but it is a possibility so i want to bring it to the table and it's ai it changes the game 21st century is is a wild one and hold on your seats we're we're not even halfway through any luck Nick? yeah i don't know like um so synthesis human machine synthesis when humans and machines come together and we put have technology just as a regular part of us like chips in our head and look through you know yeah i'm going i'm gonna stick with cyborgs to, uh, okay anyway but yeah it is wild people looking you know putting their uh take your phone or all the conversation you had with the person you can put into a computer and it'll become an ai of that person it will you can text them and it'll respond to them the way it was it would respond to you and it's not just the way that person respond to everyone if you have over a certain amount of text messages with that person saved and say they die for whatever reason forget the company but you can take it to that company and all the people who know that person can input their text messages and that AI will respond to each of those person the same way that that person would. For example, like I'm going to text my wife different than the way I text Mike and I'm going to text my parents a different the way Aww, I text Mike. You don't text me like you text your wife. You're welcome for that, Mike, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, and so then there, these people, they say they get a lot of closure of it and they could confess confess things to that person that they didn't get a chance to or whatever but i don't know it freaks me out like that's to me that's that's a little it's a little weird like i get it no one wants you know their their friend's life to end but that would be i imagine just super weird texting your air quote friend a ghost a ghost yeah like that's what it is it's a ghost and they're not that's not who's texting you back just to make you i don't know to me that that seems kind of weird. I don't know. What do you think, Mike? To me, it seems unhealthy. I can understand it'd be good for certain situations with closure, but I don't see the point of living if everyone you know is dead. And sometimes letting go is the right thing to do. An AI gives you the choice of to let go or not, which is scary to think about. And AI is so clever. I don't think people understand. Like AI, if it's losing a game, or say say this AI, uh, this has happened before. Say an AI is losing a game and it's realized it can't win. It'll pause the game forever so it won't lose. So it'll pause the game to make you quit so it can win. AI... We all know people like that. Yeah, yeah, that most definitely. But I'm all for AI assisting and helping human, humanity. I'm all for, hell, even humans and AI coming together. But using AI to keep the dead alive, something... I think life is more precious when it's finite versus immortality. What, what's the ancient saying from the Greeks? The gods are jealous of humans because everything is more beautiful because it could be your last moment. Something something like that. Could be just making it up. But AI, can, something, a simple AI can help us do incredible things, not only of the dead, but help us understand the universe. I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast and it's still, I still dream, this is, this is, it keeps me up at night, Nick. I'm not going to lie. Nick, do you know what Conway's Game of Life is? No, you're going to have to bring me up to speed. So John Conway uh, is the inventor of it. And the Game of Life, also simply known as Life, is a cellular automatron devised by the Britain, uh, the Britain mathematician John Conway. It's a zero-player game, so it means the machine just does it by itself. And it pretty much creates evolution with simple rules. Now, in this, there's different types of uh, the Game of Life. Can't, can't remember the exact term, but in Conway's Game of Life, it breaks down to four simple rules. Any cell with fewer than two neighbors dies. It, it, by underpopulation any cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation 
any live cell with more than three neighbors dies as if over a population any dead cell with exactly three neighbors will become a live cell as if by reproduction and because that simple rule of those simple rules and some dots on a piece of paper nick we actually might want to post this on our facebook or instagram we should check us out at backyard philosophy we'll create such complicated things as those four rules and some dots on a piece of paper created a computer like I don't, by your silence, I'm hoping you're processing this, but those four dots are able to reproduce and make complex systems of like sending messages across infinite amount of space. Like they're able to create spaceships. They're able to create quote unquote life, like flowers, nurturing patterns. It's, it's able to do complex tasks with some, so imagine a grid and the live cells are colored in and that the dead cells are white. And then you add those rules in together, it creates universes. And some scientists think that's how our universe came to be. There are simple rules and you hit the go button and life finds a way. And AI is helping us do that because we're doing it with ai it's this it's a game of evolution with ai and just observing how things evolve we're understanding ourselves how to simulate a universe just everything just on simple rules and ai is just running and doing it with us it's it's so scary and so beautiful at the same time and nick i gotta ask how i oh, we gotta bring it up because it's ai and universe how would you feel if we're in a simulation, like simulation theory. I mean, I don't know. I may be oversimplifying, but if we're in a simulation, I don't know that. So it really doesn't affect my day to day. So you might have to ask someone a little bit smarter or a little bit stupider than me. I don't know. <laughs> Get the answer you want. <laughs> All right. Touche. Touche. I mean, if we were in a simulation, there'd be no way to identify. And a recent study came out that there, some mathematician did the math and it comes out to we're about, it's about 50-50 shot if we're in a simulation or not. Which is... Well, okay. Here's... I, I read a book about simulation theory, which I think it's interesting, but I personally don't understand the difference between the simulation theory and, and like just normal religion. Like there's someone who created the universe. And I mean, my favorite part of it is people who are really religious and people who are really into the simulation theory both hate each other. But it, to me, it seems like they're arguing for the same things as someone with greater intelligence designed it but i guess that's beyond the point but i don't know it doesn't make that much difference to me i don't think true or it doesn't have to be someone with greater intelligence like like the conway's game of life it's oh man you made it i will not take credit but if i ever make a universe well i was referring to someone who had less intelligence mm. you know what i mean mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I'm, ca I'm catching on now i'm catching on now a little i'm a little slow nick sorry yeah All no right. i can tell oh fuck off <laughs> <laughs> anyway but um, for me, it's not... My main concern is AI making us... All right, so this is going to be kind of tying a lot of things together, but it's very important to me because I'm kind of pro-AI. I think AI will be better benefit for us. But my main problem with AI, my main concern with AI, is it might make humanity dumber. I'm glad you brought that up because that's what I was about to say too, but keep going. All right, perfect, perfect. My One of my scariest points that I ever read across from coming reading about history and humanity is by the time Cleopatra came around, they forgot, they've already forgotten how to build the pyramids. We forgot how to do science and art. Like I remember a Roman official, I think it might've been Julius Caesar himself or Augustus, can't remember who it was, killed a glass blower because he figured out how to make rubber glass. And he was, they were so scared they were gonna destroy the economy. They had him killed in his secret destroyed and we still haven't figured out to this day but if ai does all this for us and we don't have to think the ai does the thinking for us we we become cattle we become a converse we become lazy we need to learn we need hardship we need to teach ourselves we need to think and i mean i don't know about you nick but some of my best thoughts come when i'm doing basic work if i'm just you know plugging numbers kind of bored at work i'll think of something fantastic because my mind wanders and if things get too easy where we can sit on our couch and watch videos that are recommended to us by algorithms and it's just we it, it turns into the matrix of we're just a product not the user it's i don't know it and that's my main concern is ai will make things too easy for humans if that's a real concern and nick i would love to hear your opinion on it no that's exactly kind of what i was thinking um i'm gonna bring up two points so 
uh, idiocracy when he goes to the hospital. <laughs> but also, like I talked about the point I brought up about helping my profession, choosing herbicides, rate based on all these different variables. That's kind of my job. Like, so if I don't need to do my job and a machine can do my job, what's the point of me learning that if let's be honest, if the machine has enough data, enough has seen enough repetitions that it can probably identify more accurately than me what we need to do. Now, right now in my profession, we don't have that because it's a highly variable machine or highly variable situation. Like we get different a aspects might make a difference. Where we are geographically is going to make a difference. Competing vegetation, how long since it's been harvested, just a lot of different variables. And so it's something a human mind can more easily spit out an answer than a machine. But when you take that away and you take all those things away that we work so long to study for to figure out, what is it that we need to do? I mean, what what's the point of bettering yourself, bettering your mind if a machine can do everything better than you anyway? I guess to make you feel good, but I don't know. What, what do you think, Mike? What's the point of living? I mean, it. I mean, if you don't hunt, if you don't eat, you don't. You just. You just exist, and that's not living. It doesn't it? Granted, you can make the argument that AI will allow humans to maybe reach a utopia where we don't have to do certain work and we're free to explore our hobbies and just do fun things and you know just you know focus on doing exercise hang out with friends, never having to worry about, you know, running the power systems, never have to worry about over a population, never have to worry about medicines. It, the AI will do it for us, but it's, oh, eh, Nick, by any chance, have you ever read the book, The Giver? Yeah, I think we read that in high school. That book kind of fits in the situation of if you remove all these emotions, if you remove all these decisions, you're still going to need, it, it, it won't work out well. You still need people to to still know how things are done work. Like say, say the cell phone. How many people actually know how to make a cell phone? Like right now the world ended and half the population in the world died. How many people could actually make a cell phone? How, how many people could actually bring that technology back? It's not that many. And if we make things easier and we don't have to get less, use less of our brain and scientists, I imagine it'd be a bigger difference in intelligence between people. And it, it, that's very worrisome with me. Because as much evil as humanity does, we also do so much beauty. We do so much creation. In order to have the good, you must have the bad. You must have balance. You must have yin and yang. And I think AI, if misused, could take away and destroy that balance. And that's that's how I feel about it. Every time, was it in the Matrix when they create a utopia and never worked out? There's utopia, dystopia. They, they're the same. They're opposite sides of the same coin. AI could be our destroyer. AI could be our savior. But I don't think it's a good idea to have that. I don't think utopia is a good idea. I mean, Nick, look at you reading the book about AI, how much personal growth that was for you, how much that made you probably change your thinking on things. Now, granted, you can make the argument that it would be the same thing for AI, but years of evolution, billions of years are within us. And AI are new technology, and they're still trying to learn. They're trying to keep up. So it's, I don't think AI currently will be able to catch up to evolution knowledge, if that makes sense. I think it will be a few million years well, not even a million years. Let's say, let's say a thousand years before AI is on par with nature of running and coming up with ideas and adapting to situations. Na I mean, nature does it best. So I, I don't know. It's it's so complicated topic because the scientist and engineer in me loves it. It's just it's something to make my life easier, something that can help me make my code for me. So it, it, all these attributes. But then the humanitarian in me is so worried about the ethical issues. It's I guess it comes up to what's the point of living if you're not going to have struggle to make a living. Like, what's the point of living if you're never going to try to climb the mountain, I guess, is a way. And if AI makes everything flat, it's, it, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of talking in circles here, but AI is, AI is such a powerful tool. And I have no idea if we'll use it to cut ourselves or to build a new world. Yeah, it's, uh, man, it's, this is the tough topic. And there's so many different factors to it and different trains of thought. Different people are for it, different people against. It's, uh, this is probably one of the toughest toughest topics we've talked about i'd say mike it's just so in depth both from the code to write it the rules that go within the ai how the ai learns the effects of ai the 
future of AI, what AI can do, what AI can't do. There's, I feel like it's, we will definitely be touching this subject again. There's just so much to cover. It's, and as I hope we gained knowledge to you, the listeners of AI. Now, granted, we're fools with a capital F, so it's take everything you say with a grain of salt. I hope everyone does their own research. And as we start to end this podcast, I want to make some quotes before. I actually, Nick, don't make fun of me too much, but I actually made a quote for AIs because AI is. Artificial intelligence is very interesting to me. So I made a quote and I found a quote, and I I want to share them with you. My quote being, Monsters come in all shapes and sizes, and most monsters are our own creations. And a quote that I found that also I think is very fitting is, Beware of silent dogs and still waters. I think it's very fitting for AI. Yeah, I'd say we should leave it off there. That's a well. Before before we finish, Nick, I'm always curious what book you're reading and uh, where can people find us. All right, so people can find us on Instagram and Facebook on Backyard Philosophy Podcast. Uh, they cannot find us on Twitter because this is in fact a dumpster fire. And if you can explain your position in 240 characters or less, you really don't understand your position. Um, I'm currently reading uh, a book by Jared Diamond called How Societies Choose to Succeed or Collapse. I think the main title is just Collapse, but that's what it's about. And uh what do you about you, Mike? Are you still on the same uh, book? Yes, I'm still reading Breathe by James Nestor, which is a book on the importance of nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. Actually, amazing how much the human body can benefit from simply changing the way you breathe and how many health issues, mental issues, and what the body's very capable of doing because of different types of breathing, I guess is the way. It sounds nerdy and kind of yogi, but absolutely fascinating read and very eye-opening. Awesome. Thank you all for listening. Well, thanks for listening, yep. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.